for what purposes, Mr. Roy, seek recognition? Uh, I'll video back, sorry. Uh, to speak on the amendment. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, I think he was sleeping. I don't know. May, let's wake him up. Yield back. Excuse me? Excuse me? You need to turn your camera on. My camera's on. Now yeah, it is. Now we see yeah. it. Um, well, the little shot there about sleeping, it's not my rules that allows this kind of crap of a proceeding. And that's what it is. Crap proceeding. When you give us 48 hours notice and we're dealing with stuff that we have planned and we got to figure that out and we have to honor commitments and then figure out flights to come back. And now we're availing ourselves of this crap technology where half the damn committee is voting at night in their pajamas and doing, you know, Lord knows what. And then you, you want to accuse me of sleeping because I don't have my camera on? Give me a break. Let me tell you what this is all about. It's a pretext. This is all pretext. Democrats come in here saying, hey, you know, we don't want to take your guns. And then they say, we want to take your guns. This bill, oh, come on, let's all work together. We're just going to do some soft changes to the laws. You can't disagree with that. But then they admit throughout the entire afternoon what their goal is to get rid of semi-automatic weapons, to disarm the American people. That is the goal. It is a pretext, all of this, and we know it. That is the reality. And that is the reality and the basis behind what Mr. Gates is offering, a recognition of what the red flag process is all about, pretext. Right now, under the Baker Act structure and states, if you've got a real issue with someone having a being a danger to society or himself or others, you can go down that road. You can in Texas, right? Go down that road and deprive them of liberty, but go in and go in front of a judge and say, this person should be committed and then haul them under Texas law, hunt, haul in the medical personnel. And then within 72 hours, you have a follow-up hearing and all the things that flow from that. And let's talk about if you're going to deprive liberty, well, then why don't you friggin', you know, saddle up and deprive liberty and say, okay, we're going to say, here's an individual, and we're going to commit you. And then under 922 G4, the federal laws that I prosecuted in the United States Attorney's Office, then you can be deprived of weapons for the period of time that uh, you're, you're uh, committed. And I can't remember the law about how long after. But that the reality is, let's have that conversation if you want to have that conversation. But to, to sit here and say that we don't know for sure that the red flag laws that are existent in 18 or 19 states, are they effective or are they not? I've read studies by leftist leaning organizations. Mother Jones had a study in a database demonstrating not very much effectiveness. There are real questions about how they're implemented. There's very legitimate questions here about the bill on the floor in the House, about the authority of the federal government, the authority of Congress to be doing this in the first place. My friends on the other side of the aisle are critical of Mr. Gates for offering this because it's pointing to the states. Mr. Gates's response, I think appropriately, is saying, hey, uh, I want to make a position that says I think this is a depriva deprivation of rights, which is actually a federal authority and not something you just leave to the, to the courts, and that you have a discussion about how those things are implemented. But that ought, ought to be what we're talking about here. But my view on this is pretty simple. Every member of the other side of the aisle has made perfectly clear about what the goal is. It's to disarm the citizenry. And that is the actual uh, objective. And so when we're talking about red flag laws, when we're talking about uh, the, the size of the magazine, when we're talking about whether or not you've got uh, weapons that are locked up and safe, that is the objective. And I'll yield to the gentleman from Florida if he wants the time. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, look, the problem with politicians, especially in D.C., um, is that they tell the American people that we can protect them from harm, protect them from every, every aspect of evil, from every tragedy. That we're never going to let a bad thing happen again. And the people on this committee say effectively today that they can stop evil, that we must do something. But they've admitted here multiple times by multiple parties that it's all a pretext, a pretext to ban weapons. If this were about policy, if it really were, we'd be addressing facts, right? Two percent of prosecuted federal criminals have bought their weapons to retail purchases, less than or just over 10 percent of state criminals. About 0.8 percent of criminals obtained their weapons at a gun show. Crime in San Francisco is facing a recall vote of the DA. Why? Police making arrests and only 8% of crimes reported there. 
homicides are up 36%. 2021, arson is up 40% compared to 2019. In San Antonio, crime is skyrocketing. Cops won't even refer to the DA drug crimes because they won't prosecute them. In Chicago, why isn't the U.S. attorney and the DA there uh, focusing on straw purchases and other crimes to address the 800 plus homicides? Straw purchases are already a crime for people who are uh, prohibited from owning a firearm. Uh, police have been verifiably defunded in Austin to the tune of $150 million. We have 107,000 deaths and skyrocketing from fentanyl pouring across our border. Thousands and thousands of Americans. We have documented homicides by hands and knives more than rifles. I, I say that again. Hands and knives, documented homicides, are greater than rifles. We have a rot, a cultural rot in this country. Yet this legislation focuses on targeting law-abiding Americans. It would make it baseline unlawful to obtain a gun for a non-family member, friend, or acquaintance, regardless of their eligibility, like current law requires. Maybe a spouse of a military service member, like my friend from Kentucky mentioned. It would make me a criminal several times over, living as I do today. For example, uh, here I've got in this room, actually, a 20-gauge single-shot shotgun and a 22 uh, lever action. I've got these right here, and I have them sitting here in the room, out, exposed. Why? So I can go kill a snake, so I can go kill a coyote, so I can go do what I need to do and kill things, because that's what guns are for. I've got both of those guns, and I've had them since I was nine years old. And you know what? My children, who are under the age of 18, they know that those guns are to be used only to go kill a snake, to go kill a coyote, to go protect their dog if it's being chased down or tracked down. That's why we have guns. And you're saying if I leave my 20 gauge or 22 sitting out, and I have a 12 year old son, and I don't have that locked up, Oh, gosh, sorry, we got a coyote. Let me go get the key to go unlock it. That is straight up bullshit, quote Mr. Cicilline. That's what it is. And that's what you're doing to the American people. Look, now you've got a part of the provision that says you're going to set the age. We've already had a robust debate about that. I got a 45 when I was 18 years old. I guess I somehow managed to get through. The fact here is, is this is really about the left's culture war against gun owning and supporting Americans. That's what it's about. And it's about refusing to acknowledge the fundamental reason and the purpose for the Second Amendment. This is not specifically about hunting or self-defense, but even defense against tyranny. I don't accept the term weapon of war regarding the AR-15. It's not. It's used for hunting primarily. It's the most popular rifle. But even if it were, depriving the American people of the weapon, the stated goal of most or all committee Democrats today, and the target of magazines greater than 10 in this very bill to do so, then what are the citizens supposed to do if the government is tyrannically trampling their rights? What are we supposed to do? What should Americans do if the government, in conjunction with, say, international organizations, attempt to lock us in apartment buildings like they do in China to stamp out COVID? What do the American people do? In history, this is replete with examples. The Soviet Union established gun control, and from 1929 to 1953, they massacred 20 million people. Turkey, the Armenians, one and a half million people. We know about Germany and gun control and what it meant for uh, Jews and in that part of the world in Germany and Austria, Poland and throughout Europe. We have China establishing gun control in 1935 and another 20 million people that were uh, massacred. Evil is evil. And what do we know about the Uvalde shooter? It was a psychotic, evil 18-year-old who walked, talked about raping women, killing defenseless animals, and was willing to gun down fourth graders. We have a cultural rot in this country. We're stripping the dignity of work, the rule of the role of fathers in raising sons, the abuse of drugs, the missing community to stop a boy from being MIA from school, not working while sitting around playing Call of Duty and abusing animals. In order to seek the American people, I'll tell American people a lie, that the government will protect them. Half of this committee is willing to take away a citizen's God-given right to protect himself or herself from harm, and importantly, from the very tyranny being applied to them to deny that right. I yield back.